Welcome, everyone. I am delighted that you are here with us today for the Mineta Transportation Institute Research SNAPS webinar we're about to host. My name is Dr. Asha Weinstein Agrawal, and I serve as the Education Director here at MTI. MTI is a U.S. Department of Transportation funded University Transportation Center at San Jose State University. Our mission is to increase mobility for all by improving the safety, efficiency, accessibility, and convenience of our nation's transportation system. Now, just a quick housekeeping about how we're going to organize today's webinar. If you have questions for our presenters, and we do hope to have you know, five, ten minutes at the end, you can submit them through the Q&A function in, um, in Zoom here. And also, we just so everybody knows, we are recording the webinar, and the link will be available shortly after we finish up on our website and social media pages. So now, now to the focus of today's event, which is this webinar, which is a reconsideration of the American road trip. And it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce our two distinguished speakers today, Dr. Dan Albert and Dr. Allison Hobbs. Dr. Albert is an author and historian whose work explores all things mobility and has appeared in publications that range from Fast Company to the Journal of the History of the Behavioral Sciences. His most recent book is titled, Are We There Yet? The Auto American Automobile, Past, Present, and Driverless. And this book explores the history and future of car culture in America. We're also joined by Dr. Allison Hobbs, who is Associate Professor of U.S. History at Stanford University, um, where she's also the Director of the African American, African, sorry, African and African American Studies Program, and the Klein Heights Family University Fellow in Undergraduate Education. Her first book, A Chosen Exile, A History of Racial Passing in American Life, earned multiple accolades, including the American historian's Frederick Jackson Turner Prize. Her latest publications explore the unique perspectives of Black voices in the history and present of America. And with that, let me turn us over to Dan Albert. Thank you very much, Asha. Let's uh, jump right in if we can do the next slide. Uh, I'm going to start by saying that we have this kind of latent idea as, as American citizens, but also I think people around the world and uh, newly arrived people in the US of the road trip, this latent inherent idea. Uh, a lot of that comes from personal experience. I call this the unconsidered road trip. That by the way is me on the left and my uh, at the time future wife. Um, road trips are great. I encourage everyone to take one. I encourage you to leave your phone at home and you'll see on the left there a couple of highlighter pens. Use those and, and use a real old fashioned map and you'll have a great time. The other part though is it's very much in the culture um, that uh, if we look at canonical culture, the, the literature, people like John Steinbeck, uh, Kerouac, uh, William Lee Steep Moon, as well as in pop culture. This, this is, we already know what the road trip is and that's why I call it the unconsidered road trip. Let's uh, go to the next slide. What I'm gonna try to do, I think Dr. Hobbs is gonna talk a lot about the road trip and taking the road trip and the car. I'm gonna reconsider the, um, the road part of it, if you will. And I'm gonna start with what uh, I call the official story of the road trip. And this is the way it's told by both the Smithsonian Institution at the National Museum of American History in their America on the Road exhibit. And also on the left there, Horatio's Drive, documentary by Ken Burns, who's kind of the official American documenta documentarian of history. Um, the story of Horatio's Drive, and you see it here on the right, is this fellow Horatio, uh, uh, Nelson Jackson, 1903, he takes the Winton motor car on a bet from San Francisco to New York. The message in this exhibition, and you're seeing it there uh, at the Smithsonian, is there were no roads. And how harrowing and exciting and adventurous it was for him to make this trip uh, in that Winton motor car. And so it, it's kind of um, rhetoric or, or propaganda, if you will, for building more roads. Uh, in the middle there, that image is uh, a dog. You can maybe see that he's got goggles. His name is Bud, and I want you to pay attention to him. There'll be a quiz later. 
And then also you'll see him on the right there, a guy named Sewell pulling the car out of the, the mud, out of a rut with block and tackle. And again, the idea is there are no roads. So let's move on, next slide. And um, we need to build roads, but it's not just build roads in the sense of transportation. There are a lot of early roads that are about road tripping, about taking people certain places. And we'll look quickly at two of them. This first one is called the Old Trails Road. It was a coast to coast road. I'm showing you there just a small section. One of the things that's really interesting about it is it was heavily um, uh, supported and, and pushed forward by the Daughters of the American Revolution. And on the left there is Elizabeth Gentry and she was the head of the Missouri chapter and she was really behind this. So um, fascinating that it's a women's organization on the one hand to push this road through, but then also who the DAR, uh, the D Daughters of the American Revolution are. Uh, to become one, you need to prove that you are a descendant of, as they put it, an American patriot from the revolution. And they also say anybody, race, class, uh, I'm sorry, race, religion, ethnicity can join, but I, I find that kind of amusing. But she really wanted to push forward this idea that there were heroic American pioneers and they had made their way across America and we're going to build a road so that Americans can learn from and experience that, that story. What's interesting about this section I'm showing you is it's a section called Kearney's Trail. Kearney was the Brigadier General who uh, took that route to invade Mexico in 1846. So when we think about these people as patriots, we also need to think about the fact that that land that we call the United States wasn't empty, it was full of indigenous peoples, but also it was, it was an, uh, another sovereign nation and you know we took away we americans took away about a third of mexico arizona california new mexico um by um uh, invading and then of course we celebrate that with a road let's move on to the next slide and i here's a little more cheerful next slide there we go here's a little more cheerful uh story um of patriotism this fellow on the right there is named stephen mather he was the first um director of the National Park Service. When he came on, the, going to the National Parks was a very fancy thing. It was something that only rich people could do. They had to take a train, stay in certain hotels. And he said, we need a national uh, a park to park highway to create access uh, for um, the average American. Let's click again, if we could, for this slide, just to give you a better image of that, uh, that road. So that road connected Yellowstone, Yosemite, Glacier, all the great parks. And he said, I'm building this road to bring Americans to these parks because that will help every citizen develop uh, an understanding and to support those parks and also a, a great patriotic uh, vision. Let's click again for the next slide. Um, there are also um, sort of revisionist stories when we, we tell about rebuilding a road. Here you're seeing an image of uh, what were called the Okies. They were environmental refugees from Oklahoma and the other prairie states. And the Dust Bowls of the 1930s from over farming and drought were chasing them out. They had no uh, livelihood left. They packed everything they had onto these vehicles. And, and uh, John Steinbeck wrote about their journey and he describes the route they took, Route 66, uh, as the mother road, but he also says it was a terror between towns because these old vehicles, uh, you know, easily broke down and getting stuck uh, on the side of the road, it wasn't like you called AAA. Let's click again and talk about how we retold the story of that road. Um, great song in the 40s, Nat King Cole called Get Your Kicks on Route 66, and that really transformed our understanding. Now it's all about kind of American kitsch. And on the right there, those, uh, uh, the folks with the, the twins and the sons and the mom and dad in front of that peak, uh, pink uh, real Americana scene, that's the road trip. That's what we now think of as Route 66. Let's click slide again. And then I just want to remind everybody that, uh, you know, as much as this is inherent, as much as this is latent from our own experiences and the, um, you know, cultural representations, it's also used to sell, sell stuff. 
Uh, I'll ask you who that little fella is on the left there um, from 1903. Of course, that's our friend Bud with his goggles, his cutest dog in the world. And Winton, whose car that was, used that journey, that road trip to sell cars. Look at this car, 1903, September issue. They say, you know, ours is the car that made it across the country. Uh, in the 1970s, we talked about um, uh, CD USA and your Chevrolet. That was constantly updated and reused. And here it is, Chevrolet building a better way to see the USA. Um, by the way, those are SUVs, the 1970. That's the beach I grew up going to, I still go to. And if you parked your SUVs there, the cops would um, put you in jail. The, uh, the last one, and, and there's a link to the, to the um, uh, advertisement, but you know, I find this fascinating. This is uh, really trying to sell a credit card and it's the journey, the classic journey of an American family on a road trip. It's the Garcia family, uh, the Pablo Garcia family, which is a little bit about this idea of inclusion, but all of the tropes of the, the great American road trip are in that ad. Okay, so I think I'm done. I think, do I have one more slide if we can click? No, good, I am done. So that's really about the roads. The roads are not just about uh, those of you that are road builders. Don't just think about moving traffic. Understand that they have a, a history and that they are built for uh, certain political reasons, if you will. And now I'm very excited to hear Dr. Hobbs uh, kind of complicate the story of the Great American Road Trip for us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Albert. And thank you so much to the Bonetta Transportation Institute for organizing this panel and for inviting us. Um, so, so Dr. Albert has given us such a great perspective on the road and the major, ro the major role that the road and the road trip has played in our culture. And what I would like to talk about is how mobility, um, how if we look at mobility and if we think about how mobility is different for African Americans, how can we kind of reconsider the automobile and its iconic role in American culture if we think about it from the perspective of African Americans? So let's go to the next slide. I am interested in two central questions. How might the meanings of travel and the car change once removed from their mythic place in Americana? And we'll go to the next slide. And instead placed in the context of African American life. And we'll go to the next slide. The car and the ability to travel are emblematic of freedom and autonomy. But what might they mean to people who have experienced countless forms of unfreedom, whose movements have been limited, controlled, and constrained? So as we started with, and we'll go to the next slide, with Dinah Shore and her famous urging to see, for Americans to see the USA in your Chevrolet, um, most African American motorists would not have access to the mid-century pleasures of taking to the open road that Dinah Shore sang of. They wouldn't have the opportunities to explore the country, to visit the national parks in the West, as Dr. Albert described, or to enjoy the freedom of driving one's own car on newly constructed federal highways. The joys of just going and we'll go to the next slide, and the spontaneity of travel that the Beat Generation novelist Jack Kerouac waxed lyrical about in the 1957 classic On the Road were barely available to Black travelers really at any income level. And even those Black travelers who did have the financial resources to own a car had enormous difficulty on the road, finding lodging, restaurants, or gas stations that would serve them. The open road may have been a symbol of individualism and adventure for some Americans. We'll go to the next slide. But it was anything but open for those who it belittled and humiliated. And indeed, for many Black travelers, the road became an extension of the Jim Crow world rather than an escape from it. So African Americans were largely excluded 
from the car culture that flowered in the post-World War II period. We'll go to the next slide. Now, at the same time, it is very important to offer a textured account of the emotional lives of Black drivers to describe both the fears and anxieties that arose once African-American motorists got behind the wheel, but also to describe the deep sense of pride and the seduction and exhilaration that owning a car offered. The car and the road were and certainly continue to be complex sites of racial contestation. So at the heart of this story lies the tension between the dream of Black freedom and the reality of Black unfreedom, between the aspiration that one's humanity would be recognized and valued and the reality that one's dignity could be repeatedly and violently destroyed. So let me share two stories that just very briefly demonstrate that Black mobility has been an enduring historical problem that has long ignited white anxieties and led to restriction both through the law and through social customs. So we'll go to the next slide. The first example is from the 19th century. And this is an example that, that that deals with the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850, when the federal government deputized ordinary citizens to capture and return runaway slaves and punish those who interfered with capture. Slave owners often issued shoes to enslaved people, but then would collect them at night to make sure that it would be more difficult for an enslaved person to take flight. And then we'll go to the next slide. Moving forward to the 20th century, I interviewed Sylvester Hoover, who's shown here, who um, is a former sharecropper in Greenwood, Mississippi. And he told me that African-Americans who tried to leave the Delta were often stopped at the train or the bus station. The ticket taker would call the landowner to ask if he had authorized the departure. And on finding out that he had not, the ticket taker would refuse to sell tickets. In the late 1960s, family members who lived in Chicago and drove down to the Mississippi Delta with the intention of spiriting away other relatives and bringing them to Chicago, often found that their plans were thwarted when gas station attendants saw their Illinois license plates and refused to sell gas to them. Mississippi was famously known as the closed society. And as Sylvester Hoover explained, quote, with out of town license plates, everybody knew that you must be up to no good. In Mississippi, black motorists were not allowed to overtake white drivers because their cars might kick up dust from unpaved country roads onto white owned cars. Wearing a chauffeur's cap, having one visible on the front seat, or pretending to deliver a car for a white person enabled Blacks to give the appearance of subservience, of not stepping out of one's place or climbing too high, and of following Southern etiquette. We'll go to the next slide. So despite the perils and uncertainties of the road, there still is an important cultural history of the car for African Americans. And we'll go to the next slide. Cars represented a form of freedom and status that gave African Americans a deep sense of pride and self-respect. In The Warmth of Other Suns, the epic story of America's great migration, journalist and author Isabel Wilkerson described her mother driving to Georgia in a poodle skirt and a scarf folded Marilyn Monroe style and dark movie star glasses. Her mother made sure to stop and get her car cleaned before any family member or neighbor saw it because it was dusty and spotted from the drive. And she wanted to kind of show it off and show off her new life in the North. We'll go to the next slide. 
And more recently, in Michelle, Mem in Michelle Obama's memoir, Becoming, the First Lady describes her father's devotion to his car, a bronze-colored two-door Buick Electra 225. Obama writes that she wouldn't fully understand the significance of driving to her father until she was much older. She writes, quote, as a kid, I could only sense it, the liberation he felt behind the wheel, the pleasure he took in having a smooth running engine and perfectly balanced tires humming beneath him. He'd only been in his 30s when a doctor informed him that the odd weakness he started to feel in one leg was just the beginning of a long and painful slide towards immobility. I don't have the precise dates, but it seems that the Buick came into my father's life at roughly the same time that multiple sclerosis did. And although he never said it, the car had to provide some sort of relief. So in conclusion, from the earliest days of the automobile, racist laws, social codes, government regulation, and commercial practices have attenuated the mobility of black travelers. The struggles against segregation and unwelcoming places for food and shelter would lay the groundwork for the signing of the Civil Rights Act in 1964 that granted equal access to public accommodations for African Americans. But Black travelers continue to experience trauma long after the bill's passage. We'll go to the next slide. Just a month later, on August 4th, the remains of three civil rights workers, Michael Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney, were found in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Their burned out car was discovered submerged in a swamp. And we'll go to the last slide. So driving wasn't just about a fear about a flat tire or the failure of the automobile but rather about encountering unexpected and virulent terrorism on the road. These fears were always on the minds of African-Americans, regardless of their class status. African-American motorists adopted strategies to stay safe and to survive, but these psychological burdens put limitations on their ability to feel free. Terror on the road has a long history and a history that remains with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, both of our speakers, Dr. Dan Albert and Dr. Allison Hobbs. And we now have a, um, several minutes left for questions. I have a few I'll start with, but feel free to submit some through the chat um, if you would like. So I'm wondering, and this is to either or both of you, if you think about the historical evolution of, and I really liked your phrase, Allison, the dream of freedom compared with the reality of unfreedom, and sorry if I got the wording a little wrong, what are some of the things that those of us in the transportation industry have been able to do to maybe change that and, and bring the dream and the reality a little closer. So are there things we can sort of see that have happened historically? And also, can we learn from those and think about maybe things those of us in the profession now could be doing to try to, to bring greater equality to this idea of the road trip? That's a great question. And I, I can start, Dan, if that's okay. And then I think this really dovetails into your work about the road. Um, mm -hmm. But I would just start with a, with a personal story that um, for the last 40 years, my family has been going on vacation um, to Hilton Head, South Carolina. And over the course of that time, the experience of driving to, to Hilton Head from New Jersey um, has changed quite dramatically. When we first started going, um, you know, my dad had this idea that he wanted us to have the kind of quintessential road trip, to have the quintessential summer vacation. And he thought Hilton Head would be a great place to, to do that. Um, so when we first started going in the 80s, um, there was a lot more fear because the roads were, we had to drive on a lot of back roads. Um, there were not 
a lot of places to stop. Um, and my dad would often say that, you know, once we crossed into Virginia and then into North Carolina, he would sort of have feel a little bit more tension. And even in the car, I can kind of remember like a little bit of tension in the car that we were a little bit more nervous about, about what was ahead for us. Um, but then once the federal highways were constructed and once, once you know, these roads were built, um, it made the drive a lot more free. It made us feel a lot more free. There was a lot less tension in the car. There was a lot less um, of a sense that, you know, we had to sort of pack our food and, and my mom had to make all this food to bring with us on the road trip, but rather that now maybe we could stop and eat somewhere without being quite as nervous. Um, and that was as late as the 1980s, really, in, in the 90s. And, and I, I, I think my parents would say that probably there's still a little bit of fear even today, you know? Um, so I definitely think that the construction of federal highways um, really did kind of dramatically change the experience of travel for black, for black motorists. Uh, yeah, if I could speak to the highway, the road portion, um, a couple of great ironies there. One, of course, is um, the history of the interstates, particularly the urban interstates, is a very much about uh, uh, remapping uh, uh, cities and, and the whole landscape in, in support of a system of white supremacy. These were clearly designed and intended and laid out to destroy African-American neighborhoods, rip through African-American towns. On the other hand, just as uh, Dr. Hobbs said, um, they, they were um, a new and safer way to travel. Um, again, on the other hand, one of the ironies there is, and, and people talk about this, you know, the real road trip, you get off the highway, you go and see the back roads, but you're kind of, uh, restricted from that in, in the ways we've talked about uh, to a, a road system that's in a sense a, a railroad on, on rubber tires. The only other thing I'd mention and really kind of a plug is um, there's an organization called uh, um, Truckers Against Trafficking and I'd encourage you to take a look at them. This is about um, making uh, truckers um, um, allies on the road for um, particularly young women who are trafficked um, because those are those truck stops are very much sites of, of sexual exploitation and sexual slavery uh, is the word for it. All right, well, thank you. And we are almost out of time, but let me just ask if you have any ideas turning to the future, like 40, 50 years out from now, there are all these, these revolutions in technology happening. Remains to be seen whether our social institutions change much or not, but how do you think the road trip might be different, let's say in 50 years from now? I mean, I'll speak to that uh, quickly, which is I'm already concerned that the road trip, that, that uh, many of the things about serendipity, you know, getting lost, uh, making your own way, understanding the landscape is, has faded away. And that has, you know, obviously we talk about GPS, but it's also happened with the way vehicles are designed. So vehicles to, to generate this idea or create this idea that you're safe and protected, uh, windows are smaller, uh, and then also for very real reasons, big pillars for airbags and so forth. So, and, and even things like, you know, my kids have a TV screen in the back, we get in the minivan and you try to tell them to look at something, they say, put the movie back on, right? So in, in a lot of ways, even while we're on the road, we're trying to insulate ourselves from those experiences. And, and so in answer to the question, I, I see that trend continuing and, and I think it's sad. And Dr. Hobbs. I would just say, you know, I think that one thing that, that interests me is that I teach a class on road trips um, for, for Stanford students and we come up with like a set of, of, of kind of guidelines and rules um, um, before we go on the trip. And every year the students insist that no one can bring a cell phone. Mm -hmm. that everyone has to leave all of their technology behind. And we end up going through like a lot of extra work to get cameras, get actual cameras so that you can't even use your cell phone for, to take pictures. 
Um, we go through a lot of work of, of finding maps and printing out maps and doing what um, what Dr. Albert suggested in terms of, you know, using the highlighter for the, for the map. And, and we actually um, sort of force ourselves, we actually plan into the, to the road trip, like a getting lost time, which always sort of upsets um, our, our, our driver, our, our, the, 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 the bus driver or, or kind of upsets you know, when, when I have to get the funding through Stanford, they, they want us to have like a really clearly set out um, plan. And so when I say, well, you know, we, we will, but we also want to have like at least an hour of spontaneity. Um, so I, I have a lot of confidence in sort of future generations that they will be very kind of aware and critical about the use of technology sort of um, or the overuse of technology and that perhaps maybe they will sort of want to kind of recreate these more adventuresome, more spontaneous experiences like Dr. Dr. Albert described. Um, but, but I, I, but I do think that it does say a lot to say that, you know, we have to, actually plan spontaneity you know we have to you know take this very um we have to kind of all make this decision that we're going to leave the phones at home and you know that's that 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 really shows us how entrenched our technology is in in our daily lives now well, I'm, we'll have to wrap up most unfortunately, but I just want to mention one of our, our listeners asked about sort of the American road trip without a car. And that just, I think, ties in an interesting way to Dr. Hobbs' discussion of sort of planning versus serendipity. And to what extent is the serendipity possible by shared modes um, or, of course, active transportation modes. At any rate, um, thank you all so much for joining us for this Mineta Transportation Institute webinar, See the USA in Your Chevrolet, The American Road Trip Reconsidered. We will have this available, the, the video with the slides for you to share with colleagues or friends. And also please consider tuning in for our next webinar, which is in partnership with the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition, and that will be reporting out on a new MTI research report titled Surveying Silicon Valley on Cycling, and that's happening on September 24th at 7 p.m. So again, I thank our speakers so much um, for sharing their, their resources and ideas um, and intellectual understanding of this topic with us and hopefully giving us all a few things to think about in our current work as we plan for the future. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.